Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Jim Olson, Assistant Executive Director of the National Tile Contractors Association, and thanks for attending today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Steam Rooms, Principles of Proper Design. This educational webinar will preview the principles of proper steam room design, includes design, selecting the proper materials, slope, and industry standards. There are major differences between a commercial steam room, continuously running, and a residential steam room used on occasion. There have never been better mortar products for the tiling of steam rooms and steam showers. Understand the benefits of recent changes to TCNA and industry standards. Don't get steamed by bad design. Our sponsor for this presentation is MAPE. Now, before we begin, as usual, I must take care of a little business. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the participant feedback or chat screen on your computer to type in questions. We will answer all of your questions at the end of this presentation. Our webinars are archived and available to watch at any time after the webinars are presented. Please check your chat screen as I will um, uh, put my email address and how to get the archive version and then please request it with me um, later. Send me an email. If the audio on your computer is poor, um, someone will get back to you with a number to call in and uh, just raise your hand or put a question in on the chat screen. All right, here we go. Today's speaker, Jim Whitfield, FCSI, CCPR, LEED, AP, alphabets all the way, is the Director of Technical Services at MAPE. He manages a strong technical service department that provides support for MAPE's many products for tile and stone installation, floor covering installation systems, and products for wood flooring. He is actively involved in the development of tile industry standards on TCNA, ANSI, ISO committees, and a proud member of the NTCA Technical Committee. Jim is the current president of the MMSA, Materials, Methods, and Standards Association. In addition, the Construction Specification Institute, CSI, honored Jim with fellowship in 2000. Congratulations, Jim, and welcome. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. So I'm coming to you from uh, the Construct Conference in Washington, D.C. at Gaylord National Resort. Um, we're here for the CSI show, and I'm away from the show, obviously, right now, but using my cell phone, so hopefully we don't have any real interruptions. Um, I want to talk today about steam rooms and principles of proper design. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the industry standards and TCA handbook regarding this, and I think they're important ones to get out there and people to understand. First, I want to talk about the differences between commercial and residential steam rooms or steam showers, the important design issues related to creating a proper steam room, the importance of the right waterproof membrane and how to incorporate that into a steam room or steam shower, and common issues we see in steam room design uh, that unfortunately we see failure with and how to avoid them. I also want to point out this picture on the right of my screen is um, from a uh, five-star NTCA member, uh, LTS uh, Lambert Tile and Stone, and a beautiful gauge porcelain tile installation steam room, by the way. So steam room, kind of what the dictionary kind of gave good definition, uh, simple but good definition. A room, as in a Turkish bath, that is heated to an extreme temperature by steam. So anyway, as I mentioned earlier, I want to talk about the proper design, waterproofing, the E96 method E test, which is critical to the waterproof membrane, a vapor barrier or membrane, penetrations and how to treat them, sheet membranes versus liquid membranes, the TCNA handbook methods, diary of a steam room gone bad, unfortunately, and uh, movement joints. So a few years ago, I'll say 15 plus years ago, TCNA, the backer board committee, put together a thing called environmental exposure classification. I don't think that was a complete, uh, I think it was just environmental classification at the time. And the idea was that depending on the type of board being used, 
put together a rating system, if you might, on where that could be used, if it could be submerged, if it could be you know, in a wet area, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, rating systems of uh, R1 to R7 and COM1 to R COM7. Um, the steam rooms fall right into Res4, COM4, uh, in the case of residential, high humidity, heavy moisture exposure, Tile surfaces that are exposed to continuous high humidity or heavy moisture exposure, uh, intermittent use, showers, steam walls, ceilings, and floors. Commercial installations or COM4, again, high humidity, heavy moisture exposure, tiles that are subject to continuous to high humidity and moisture exposure, especially in enclosed areas. Examples, continuous use steam rooms uh, steam showers, walls, and ceilings. So that's a big difference there. These ones sometimes run 24/7. Maybe in a you know athletic facility like a YMCA or a, uh, or a health club, as opposed to the residents that might be used once a day, might be used once a week. Big big differences. Again, this kind of shows you the R R1 to R7 um, from dry environment all the way through to uh, really submerged. And, and, and that's where this really became the environmental exposure classification, is that it, 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 we decided to use it more for wet conditions than we did for backer boards. So it's an entirely different animal today. If we look at our uh, COM1, it's just commercial dry areas, hallways, etc. Um, you start looking at COM2, it's commercial limited water exposure. So it might be a bathroom wall and powder room, um, could be kitchen walls, um, etc. But really just limited exposure to water. COM3 is commercial wet. So this is where you're getting into enclosed pool areas, shower walls, floors, tub walls, um, gang showers, commercial kitchens, which take a lot of abuse. And COM4 we just went over, which is again with steam rooms, um, just to finish it out. COM5 is commercial with high temperatures, uh, greater than 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So examples could be saunas, um, furnaces, furnaces uh, some commercial kitchen floors and walls, et cetera. And COM6 is exteriors. COM7, as I said, is submerged, so like water features, pools, spas, um, those types of things. There's about four pages in the handbook, in, in the TCNA handbook, in the environmental exposure classification that lists every single TCNA method, and then whether it's available for tile or stone, that's what you see in the second column, the T or S, obviously T being tile, and then if it's available for Res4, COM4, um, and you see quite a few of them really are not until you get into the SR uh, 613 and 614, the steam room details, so it's really just a quick check sheet, very, very handled, handy tool if you get used to it. So we're going to start off with the commercial application. SR613, it's a masonry block wall or concrete wall with a mortar bed. So this is really intended for continuous use, again, like an athletic facility, Turkish bath, Roman spa, um, aroma grottos where you can get your essential oils and steam at the same time. SR614 is the residential one. It's wood or metal studs, mortar bed, or CMU, concrete uh, backer unit, um, and steam rooms or steam showers. And you see a steam shower here to the right. Some great tile contractors sent me off some beautiful pictures to use in my presentation. Very appreciated. Let's get back into the SR613, the masonry one. So steam rooms, and these notes are in the method itself. Steam rooms are highly specialized applications. Design and installation are critical to avoid damage to adjoining materials from vapor migration. Design criteria must include consideration of necessary insulation and temperature and humidity differential. This next point kind of gets into this a little bit more, and, and I'll come back and talk about dew point and, and moisture. But dew point must be considered in the construction of a steam room. 
one side of the wall will always be considerably, considerably warmer than the other side. I can tell you I've seen this in many, many installations. I've seen it where uh, one wall in a commercial steamer is just discolored, uh, the outside wall, of course. And you, you start thinking about it. I mean, I was in the dry environment when I saw this. It was in the Colorado area. The outside was much drier than inside in the steam room, and the moisture was wanting to drive through that wall, and it was collecting on the outside of the wall because they had an exterior insulation finish system or a foam system. So the foam is fairly impervious, and the moisture just collected behind it. That just colored the grout. Well, the rest of the steam area looked fantastic. I've seen areas in a commercial uh, athletic facility where steam will just drive right through the block wall. Um, I was on a project one time, in a, again, at a large athletic facility, and they said that our mortar had failed, uh, only in the upper half of the wall, by the way. And I, I thought it was a little bit odd. I went to go check it out with them. And they had a steam room on one side of the wall, and it was a good-sized wall, probably 20 feet long. On the other side of the wall were toilets and, and bathroom pieces. And they were correct. The, you know, four feet up on the wall was well-bonded, seemed solid as anything, and the upper part of the wall was actually buckling away from the wall. And I said, I, I, I can't comprehend why one area would work and the other would not. And I said, are you positive that you used the same mortar, same tile, et cetera, et cetera, in the upper part? And they said, well, that's interesting to ask that question. We originally were only going to do a wainscoat and take it up about four feet. And then they came back to a change order, and they wanted to do it all the way to the ceiling. And I said, and you used the same mortar? And they said, yeah, we used mortar. And, of course, we took off the tiles, and they had used mastic. The steam and actually melted the mastic. It looked like a primer had been applied to the CMU wall. And the tiles had expanded because they weren't well bonded and of course got wet and so they wanted to expand. And that wall was done entirely wrong from that part up. But just a good example of how st strong that steam can be. Dew point is critical when we start taking a look at, at, at where the moisture is going to go, where it might collect, because we don't want to collect it inside the wall and starting to decay studs and so on away. So some general construction notes again going on. Bonded waterproof membrane, sheet, liquid, or trial on must be continuous and must adequately limit vapor transmissions into adjacent spaces and building materials. According to the intended duration of the use of the steam room or steam shower. So that's an important point. Um, they said continuous use. That doesn't mean you do the floor at one time, then you come back and you're going to do the wall, maybe you do the ceiling, hope it ties in. It needs to be very continuous. And once we get into the methods and some of the details, with slip joints and so on, I think you'll see exactly what we really mean there. Very, very important. Use of a tile contractor, knowledgeable in steam room insulation and experience with the material specified is recommended. So that's in the notes of the TCNA standard or method. I can't stress it enough. If you don't understand water management, how to protect against that, you know, the importance of doing a slip joint, the importance of having proper movement joints, um, I would not suggest you tackle a steam room, certainly not a commercial one. Insulation, how that can benefit. Careful coordination must occur between the door manufacturer and waterproofing. Attention must be paid to the installation of glass doors, casing, and doors in general. Minimize penetrations, you seal those that occur. This is where we see a lot of failures. People drilling through the waterproof membrane, including in a steam room. People putting in a light up above, a uh, can light, and, and just penetrating the whole thing and water's collecting on the ceiling. Um, it's a very, very important part. You start making penetrations, they have to be sealed off properly. You have to figure out how you're going to keep moisture from uh, accumulating those walls uh, or in that light, or for that matter, when they drill out in the, in the curb to put in that glass door. This is a change that occurred 
in the TCNA handbook meeting eight, ten years ago, I'd say about eight years ago. And it's an important one and one that most people don't know about and don't truly understand. I'll, I'll try to explain it as well as I can and hope, hopefully it will help, again, provide better steam showers. In the waterproofing section in the SR613, and it's also required in the residential one as well, it says steam rooms designed for continuous use applications that's an important part of it, continuous use applications, should specify a low perm waterproof membrane. A waterproof membrane meaning ANSI A11810 and with a water vapor permeance rating of 0.5 perms, 0.5 perms or less, when tested to the ASTM E96 procedure E, tested at 90 degrees, 90% 90 relative humidity. If you look down, you'll see the, the different methods within the E96 test. And if you look at procedure E, and I know it's very small, I apologize for that, but um, it says that the desiccant me method is at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So we are testing that membrane at 90% relative humidity and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really a very a, a difficult test. I'll say 95% of all uh, perm ratings and, and, and tests that are done in E96 are done with procedure A. And that's like air barriers on the outside of a building, uh, weather barriers, um, a lot of waterproof membranes, and of course most building materials are tested like drywall and so on just for perm ratings in general. But giving an example, in this same method, it says that when a waterproof membrane with a water vapor permeance rating greater than 0.5 perms is specified, a vapor retarder behind the wall assembly is required, and a vapor retarder must have water vapor permeance rating of 0.1 perms or less when tested to ASTM E96 Procedure A. Tested at 50% relative humidity and 93.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So this assembly, and I'm going to try and pick up an a arrow for you, for me, I guess, really, but so I can point out some things. Wow, success. This mud, mud bed going over the top of this masonry, what you've got here is you've got a vapor barrier running right down here all the way across the concrete. In front of that is some insulation, then some metal lath, et cetera, and I'll come back to that. But what you see is this vapor barrier comes down and it overlaps right over the waterproof membrane or the shower pan. So it's all properly ship lapped or if you might, you know, lapped over the front of it so water comes down that wall, uh, it, it accumulates, the insulation cools it down so that it, it, it doesn't create a dew point issue. It comes right down that vapor barrier, gets caught in the shower pan membrane, comes down with the pre-pitch and goes to the drain. Very, very functional. Very, very good. So the other alternative would be you could um, come over the mud bed and put the membrane right over the top. If you, had a, if you had a waterproof membrane that met the E96 Procedure E test, um, you, it, it, it was successfully passed um, with 0 0.5 perms or less, you could do it over the mud bed, but then you'd have to create a slip joint here, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, uh, and just put it right over the top of the mud. If it does not pass that in a single coat, then you're definitely going to have to go back and do the vapor barrier and a, and a waterproof membrane. I hope that makes some sense. That's a big change and uh, an uncommon test, really, again, but really thought it was a very practical when it came to um, what we were trying to accomplish with steam rooms here for a detail. Just trying to make them a little bit more bulletproof, if you might. Check with the membrane manufacturer for suitability for applicable conditions, as not all membranes are suitable for steam high temperature and or chemical exposure. Um, I'd tell you our company has half dozen waterproof membranes and um, I know of two that meet the E96 um, procedure E. So they don't all meet it, that's fact. So check with the manufacturer, check with your, your everyday supplier and make sure you get the proper waterproof membrane or put a vapor barrier back there to protect. 
Some waterproof membrane manufacturers require the use of a of vapor retarder membrane in addition to a waterproof membrane, just like I was just talking about. It's not uncommon. Um, you'll see quite a bit. If you read the waterproof membrane recommendations and or it says anything about steam rooms, it'll, it should tell you the appropriate way to go. Again, we passed this so many years ago that I know there's a few manufacturers out there with, with ones that have passed. So consult the membrane manufacturer for requirements. When used, vapor retarder membrane must weather lap itself and lap into the shower pan membrane. That's what I had showed you earlier with the, with the cross. I'm sorry, with the uh, arrow, is that lap uh, to the shower pan membrane. I'll do it again because I think it's very, very important. So you've got the vapor barrier, a retarder coming right down this wall. A good example of that might be uh, uh, a, a six mil um, disc queen um, coming down the wall, and it just comes in and overlaps the shower pan, which is already in place. If a vapor retarder membrane is required, an integrated bonding flange cannot be used. So this only works with the traditional drain uh, and pre-slope. So I just want to really point that out. The only way that could be used. If that's your preferred plumbing method, and this is not going to be suitable for you, you're going to have to find the single coat or the waterproof membrane that can be applied um, over the top of the surfaces. Follow waterproof manu membrane manufacturer's directions to interface between drain and membrane. Design professional should specify adequate insulation of the walls and ceilings to reduce condensation. Consult insulation manufacturer for application suitability. So the reason why a lot of times they're putting insulation not just behind a mortar bed, but they'll do it behind cement board as well sometimes. Generally, it's a rigid insulation. Um, sometimes it could be a bat insulation as well. But the reason for that is we're trying to stop that condensation from occurring in the wall cavity. So if we're creating a lot of heat or steam inside of a steam room and it wants to drive through that wall, the insulation cools it down, the vapor barrier picks it up and brings it right back into the shower pan. As opposed to if we didn't have the insulation there, it's feasible that with enough heat, I'll say some membranes could possibly even melt, but it would get past that membrane um, maybe through uh, penetrations where it's been fastened and collect inside that wall cavity possibly starting to decay wood studs or, or metal studs in the case of residential. So very, very important. Seal all membrane penetrations with the appropriate sealant according to the membrane manufacturer's requirements. You need to know that not every sealant is suitable for steam rooms. Um, you know, most urethane type sealants work well, silicone sealants work well. Um, few others, but what you don't want to be doing is buying what I call uh, designer caulks or uh, siliconized acrylic type caulking. Uh, a lot of that, you know, again, being a, an acrylic, kind of water-based, um, if water gets to it, it wants to re-emulsify that type of material, especially in the case of steam or of all things if it gets to it too early. So maybe you've got a, a mortar bed in the floor uh, where the floor meets the wall, you put a siliconized acrylic in there, it's just going to turn to cottage cheese. It's not going to perform well. So you really need one that can take a lot of abuse and will hold up for a long time. Again, I'd recommend urethanes, uh, silicones. We'll get into that a little bit more in movement joints. But specify slip joints at changes in planes, such as where walls and ceilings meet. So I can't blow this apart too much more, this drawing, but um, I think you can see right here that membrane is coming right across here. It slips behind this backer rod. Again, continuous, it starts up the ceiling. Same thing occurs at the floor. It's continuous. So the membrane kind of wraps into that opening. Now this happens to be a detail we have for an expansion joint in the floor, but it's the same principle. We've got a waterproofing come across here, comes down around, or fills that joint, comes back up, and goes across. A backer rod is installed, just as you see here. 
and then a sealant over the top of it. So you've got a moving movement joint. But this is what they call a slip joint. Same thing we've got here and the same place where the floor meets the wall. Very, very important. In addition, where you've got those slip joints, you have to cut the metal lath. I know a lot of people are quite proud of their lath expertise and their ability to wrap areas, but it's a movement joint. It has to be cut for it to function. Very, very critical. This is probably one of the most critical parts of the whole installation is how those movement joints are handled. So pay close attention to that. And again, these are the recommendations within the standard itself. Talk about a little bit of a little bit about slope. Um, again, in the handbook it says slope ceiling is a minimum two inches per foot to avoid condensation dripping onto the occupants. Sloping ceiling from the center can minimize rundown on walls. So sometimes rooms are so big that to just pitch them one direction, two inches per foot can be quite a slope. Uh, Quite often, they'll take it from the center and, and do that, so they're going to two different areas. And you can direct that water. You can direct it away from people off to the side, as an example, sometimes. Um, generally, steam rooms, as rooms, are going to be from uh, the longer part of that room is going to be the seating area. Not always, but that's more common. Um, and so, again, you just mainly want it running down the wall, not onto people. Um, commonly done flat, it's a big mistake, huge mistake. Slope the shower pan membrane a minimum quarter inch per foot to weep holes in the drain. So again, a traditional type sheet pan membrane or liquid membrane, like you see here, over a pre-slope. Shower receptors, curbs, seats, etc., uh, must be properly detailed and installed to avoid water damage to adjacent building materials. See common shower configuration section. Again, that's in the handbook. So if you're putting in a seat, you want to make sure that it's pitched so that it drains towards the front as opposed to the back and it just collecting or pooling back there. Very, very important. We really like to see slope in all these areas so that water gets off it as quick as possible. It's quite dangerous. Somebody can slip on it, etc. Design professional to specify adequate insulation in walls and ceilings to reduce condensation. Consult insulation manufacturer for applicable suitability. Again, as I mentioned, this isn't just in, uh, this happens to be the wood stud, I'm sorry, this is the residential one. And I don't have a lot of uh, uh, slides on that one because I covered so many of the important same points in, in the commercial one. But here even with cement board, quite often there's a rigid insulation put here. Seal all membrane penetrations with appropriate sealant according to the manu membrane manufacturer's requirements. I'll also point out over the top of that cement board still, there's a waterproof membrane, comes back, comes around the slip joint, goes off of the top. So the detail looks the same, but entirely different products being used to build this. We want to have that expansion joint there. As I mentioned earlier on the commercial one, you know, this happens, occurs also right here in the floor where the cement board and the two cement boards meet. We've got a back rod and sealant there waterproof membrane over the top of it. Continuous. Oh, whoa. Sorry about that. Um, for steam showers or steam rooms framed with wood or metal studs, that's what the method calls for. Specify mortar, mortar bed options when the wall uh, needs flatness such as when tiles greater than 15 inches on one edge are specified. So one of the big benefits, obviously, of a mortar bed is taking irregularities out of a wall. Um, and that's a big issue today. Uh, we see it a lot uh, with cement board. Obviously, we don't see a drywall in, in steam rooms, but um, on walls in general. And check with the manufacturers. I mean, I think a lot of our manufacturing uh, uh, materials that can be used well on a wall, they're non-sag, um, might have a variety of, of, of capabilities of going anywhere from an eighth of an inch to an inch and a quarter in thickness. So if you need to correct a cement board wall, most manufacturers probably have a, a patch product that would perform well there. 
Maximum stud spacing in the steam room should be 16 inches on center. Very, very important. So on the left, you see, uh, going to a few things we see commonly uh, not properly done. Um, obviously, moisture collecting in the ceiling on the left. It's a flat ceiling. Not only is it not too attractive on the ceiling, you can imagine sitting underneath that, unless you want to sit in the rain. It's feasible. Um, and a light, uh, you know, on an excussion on, on, in the wall. It's just improperly sealed. And you can see how it's starting to rust all around it. That's starting to collect in the corners. Um, not a good application. Not something we really want to see. It's not going to perform long. Yeah. When you open up the steam door, you can see where mold's starting to accumulate on the ceiling, um, where all that goes right straight up and is absorbed into the drywall. This is not the same steam room, but another steam room where you can not only see mold on the seats, but just throughout the steam room. Not too comfortable. Most steam rooms have a, uh, an evacuation uh, for moisture as well, so, but I mean they're all done correctly. This is a steam room I saw in southern Colorado. This is a $30,000 steam room in a doctor's house. And they used a single component, ready-to-use grout, um, urethane technology, and let it cure for a good seven days, which was the recommendation at the time. They don't recommend it for steam rooms today, I don't believe. And it wasn't adequate. So they fired it up. Moisture went right through the joint because it was not a solid yet and started collecting behind the wall. Very, very unattractive. That is not the mortar. That is purely just moisture getting through the grout. So proper selection of grout, ready-to-use grouts probably are not appropriate for any of these. I don't know anybody that I'm aware of that really recommends it for a steam room. Um, there were some people years ago, but I think they've learned their lesson. They don't perform well in this type of application. I'm going to take you through a uh, repair on a steam room. So you can see this door sill is starting to get mold on it. Uh, on the right is where uh, the glass door was. Taking that off there, there's a uh, PVC shower pan. And okay coverage, not the greatest coverage, but a lot of issues in this, in this installation. And I'll take you through some other areas on the floor and the bench, et cetera. But um, cement board, nailed uh, right through the membrane, of course. Uh, not, not the best installation. Yep, that's a nail. When in doubt, nail it. That's the studs that came out, so you can see some of the water damage. There's two doors in this thing. So you're seeing another door that was just recently removed, and the, uh, the one behind it is, is the one that we're seeing on the floor here. So the two-by-fours were used for the curb, and those two-by-fours, you can see how much water rot is in those. Again, because they nailed through it. And not to mention, the shower door was right through the membrane. Water damage in those curbs, not only to, to the, sti the studs on the side, um, but that tear that you see in the waterproof membrane in the upper right-hand corner uh, had already occurred. That was not from removing it. It was just brittle and, and had torn. The other doorway, and you can also see on the left here where that membrane is nowhere close to coming together. It's just torn. The seat is also starting to accumulate mold. So not properly sloped. Of all things, this steam shower had a flat pan. It was not sloped to the drain. And once it got to the drain, you can see all this junk up underneath the collar of the, or the throat of the drain. So it was flat. And when it hit the drain, it had to go uphill. So that means it had to fill up with water in order for it to get into the drain. Not good. Not good at all. 
any pinhole in, or bad corner is going to cause all kinds of damage, which it did. That area cleaned up. Some of the damage to the, dry, to the uh, plywood. And the seat you can see in the back, the membrane seemed to be okay, but starting to rot the, the seat. I know it's common to build seats out of plywood uh, for structure, but not a great idea. I'm a block guy. If you can build your curbs out of, out of block and, or your seat, it's obviously in commercial you pretty much have to, but it's the only way they're going to perform long term. Of all things, though, if you put any pan in, make sure it's properly sloped. You can also see if you look really to the left, not only is it damage the plywood, which is going to have to be replaced, but it's starting to eat away at the studs. Again, in that back area, you can see the same underneath the seat. Now, going back with the proper uh, membrane and metal lath over the two doorways. And also, the membrane was not carried high enough up uh, over the curbs. It needs to be at least three inches above the curb. Mudded and beautiful, repaired. With proper slope to the drain, metal lath at the doorways, sealant inside the doors when they're installed to make sure that it was totally sealed off. A good performing steam room, still in condition, this good condition today, and this repair was done 10 plus years ago. Another look at it. There is a little bit of color difference between the stone on the walls if you really look, and that's just going to happen. There's not much you can be able to do to prevent that. I just really want to stress, water management is critical. It can be quite destructive. Look at the Grand Canyon. Seriously. Very, very uh, eroded away. It's purely from just water running. Let's talk about movement joints. Yes, they're required in the steam room as well. Um, I always like to go over this in almost any presentation just because I think it's important information and it critical to all tile installations. It's by far the most common failure we see in any installation. So ANSI has information A108.1, 3.7 section, very important to the sealant or movement joints as well. One of the important statements it has in there is that it's not the intent of these specifications to make movement joint recommendations for specific projects. The specifier is responsible to specify and detail movement joints and show locations. All openings for movement joints shall extend completely and directly through the tile work down to the structural backing. Membranes may remain continuous. So I really like to stress that again, in the case of steam rooms, it has to remain continuous. The main thing they're trying to get at here is that a movement joint is not a movement joint if it's filled up with mortar. A movement joint is not a movement joint if it's filled up with garbage. I've been on jobs where the mortar is three quarters of the way up through the joint and they got a thin layer of sealant over the top and they call it a movement joint. We all see it with a thin layer of sealant over the top of grout in inside and outside corners and backsplashes and areas like that. But when you get exterior and you don't allow for the movement, something's going to give, guaranteed. It needs to be open to the back of the tile back a rod put in and proper movement joint uh, uh, sealant put over the top of it. Very, very critical. Movement joint design and spacing shall comply with TCNA method EJ171. Just one page of an eight-page document, EJ171, but uh, the TCNA handbook. And where do you put those? So inside corners, the perimeter, this kind of, we just put this detail in there not too long ago, and it really kind of lays it all out and gives you a good idea. Exterior um, perimeter movement joints are required for exteriors. 
um, the outside corner, not the inside corner. Inside corner is required in all cases, outside corner and exterior only. Perimeter and field movement joints within the tile installation are essential and required. This section provides general recommendations and guidelines, including the means by which movement joints in substrates are to be carried through and incorporated into the tile installations. Really the important part here is we're not trying to make the tile installer make the decisions on where these belong, but you know where the movement typically occurs, but not as well as a design professional. If there is a design professional on the job, they have the responsibility to show them on the drawings. Because of the limitless conditions and structural systems on which tile can be installed, the design professional or engineer shall show specific locations and details of the movement joints on project drawings. Preparation of openings, le openings left by the tile contractor and installation of backup strip and sealant should be specified in the caulking and sealant section of the job specification. Very, very important. Typical recommendations are now interior every 25 feet, exterior every 8 to 12 in each direction, interior tile work exposed to direct sunlight or moisture, I'll call that a steam room, what do you think? Every 8 to 12 feet. Again, for steam rooms, every 8 to 12 feet, and perimeters, protrusions through the wall. Above ground slabs, maximum 12 feet in each direction, and perimeter joints. Movement joints are required where tile butts restraining surfaces. So I can't stress it enough. You want to talk about thermal movement. Uh, steam room is a perfect example. A uh, commercial one that stays in operating all the time is going to stay fairly continuous or, or reach an equilibrium. But as a residential, that's turned on and turned off, massive movement. And quite often, these things are done with a finish like a glass tile like you saw in the doctor's uh, steam room. Uh, that's not going to hold up well. I'll tell you that straight out. Absolutely not. So pay attention to movement joints. Can't stress it enough. Make sure the joints are open and you've got a back rod and sealant in there. Or at least bond it on two sides and, and tape at the back side. Sealants work best when bonded only on the two sides. Generally, you want a sealant joint that is half the depth of the width. So if I had a quarter inch joint, I'd like it to be an eighth of an inch at the, at the middle of the joint. Pretty much shaped like an hourglass if I'm going over back a rod. Well, again, here's some things on the ceilings. Um, I lean towards silicone. Uh, it's a pretty versatile. And also pointed out here that there are, they can contain plasticizers, which might migrate into a natural stone, stain it. So test it first. Um, polysulfide sealants are probably the oldest technology and certainly still around. And urethane, urethane sealants, one benefit of urethane sealants, depending on the job, commercial type jobs, um, they can be colored pretty easily. Most manufacturers have sealants for this type of installation and those are also pre-colored to match grouts. Some of the guidelines for Using different sealants, there's a type S for single component sealer uh, sealant as opposed to you know, two-part. Um, there's a multi-component sealant, sealants for joints that are horizontal, non-sag sealants. So those are what you're probably looking for if you're doing steam rooms, at least certainly where the ceiling meets the wall and wall-to-wall, -wall, et cetera. Class 25, sealants that can stand plus or minus 25% increase and decrease. In other words, it could be expand and contract that much. Type T, which is for traffic. Shouldn't have a lot of traffic in a steam room. Um, NT for non-traffic. And then there are others that are recommended for M and G, which is mortar to glass or mortar and glass. Wrap up. Um, I really want to stress steam rooms are very, very detail-oriented type installations, very critical that it be done correctly. Uh, when you think about the power of steam, look at the steam engine. And this is strong enough to, to power a, a train, strong enough to power cars. Um, again, very, very powerful. You can get into nooks and crannies. Pinholes can become major issues. Uh, so doing proper detailing in steam rooms is critical. Carefully follow the TCNA methods and ANSI standard regarding steam rooms. 
Know the finer details of steam rooms. Like I said, the slip joints would be a great example. Know what's appropriate setting material, waterproof membrane, grout, or sealant. And again, understand steam is powerful. It can easily destroy walls, floors, wood, cause major leaks, cause mold, cause decay, cause you to move out of that house or structure. So can't stress it enough. Make sure they're done correctly. It's the only way they're going to hold up. All ears, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. That was fantastic. A lot of information presented there, and you brought a lot of concerns to our attention, things we should be looking for. I want to make sure everybody knows, because there was so much information, look at your chat screen, your question and answer screen, and you will see um, my email address. You can request the archive version to review with your employees, your clients, uh, to go over again for your you know, second, third, fourth, fifth time, whatever. There's also a link to click on to get this. So um, take advantage of that. Jim, we do have a, a couple quick questions here. We didn't have too many questions yet. We might get more as we talk. Um, I'm going to quickly, let's see here. I'm going to move back to slide number 14 because I think that's what these are, are from. Um, so what percentage of steam rooms, steam showers, versus regular showers are you seeing a residential and commercial installation? Great question. Um, so we see both. I mean, it, it, it depends on institutional work. You know, if you're doing universities, if you're doing like athletic facilities, et cetera, um, we see steam rooms and, and so on in there. But really, in general, it's probably the everyday steam rooms is going on. More of a contractors are doing residential by far. Um, I think, you know, I reached out on, on Tile Geeks, a, a group on Facebook, for some pictures and so on. And I got some from a few people I recognized at the end of the, my program. But um, I got one person that rolled me on a commercial installation. And I was really kind of begging for that, too. And it was a YMCA, and I never got the pictures. But still, um, I'd say by far, residential is more common than commercial. I will also say that residential fails more commonly than commercial because they're the details aren't paid. Nobody's paying attention to it. A lot of these guys going in just think they're waterproofing like they're doing a shower, and that's not going to perform. So, and I also want to mention, Jim, I did not. I had the full screen on my side, so I wasn't seeing the questions come in. No, it's okay. You're not. You, you're just do the. I'll read these to you. So we'll go through them. It's not a problem. Um, so when we were on slide 14, Jim, someone asked if you could explain it again. I'm. A, I'm. I'm probably have to go through everything you were talking about on this slide. There wasn't any real detail, but they were asking if you could explain it again. Okay. Um, let me go, let's see if I can go back to full size. Well, let me try to do it without that. So I'm guessing the question is about the vapor barrier. Um, so if you have a membrane that has passed the E96 method E, then it could be used just over the top of the mortar bed with a slip joint, et cetera, top and bottom, continuous membrane. Um, but it's got to be, it's got to have pass that. If not, you have to use hey, a Jim? vapor barrier. Hey, Jim, uh, Jim, let me uh, interrupt. I'm just being told it's this slide, number 13. Okay. Well, same thing. I think it's really all about the okay. when you use a vapor barrier and you don't. You know, and, and so if you've got a waterproof membrane that is past the, the ASTM E96 method E, again, 100%, 100 degrees and 90 whatever percent humidity, um, it's been tested underneath that and it's performed well, then you could apply just that membrane. If you do not have a membrane that passed that and or the manufacturer recommends you put a vapor barrier behind it as well, then you would have to put a vapor barrier on the wall first. Generally, that's like I said, it's a visqueen, um, maybe six mil, 10 mil, uh, uh, and then they're gonna start their insulation, their mud bed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, does, does that help? I mean, I, I really, if, if you check with your setting material manufacturer, I know, I, I believe our salespeople know very clearly which ones do and don't pass that test. We do have it on our TDSs, um, pretty, pretty, pretty clearly, and uh, so. Just I'm being told that you, 
I'm being told right. you answered his question. So. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Again, I, I, that doesn't surprise me. I knew this was going to be a, a, a real questionable area. Definitely. Good, good stuff, though. Okay, since there's not a TCNA method for stone in a steam shower or steam room, who is the authority on how to put this together, or how do we determine what stone is safe to use in this application? Personally, I'd go to NSI, National Stone Institute. Um, if you're a member of the NSI, they're, they're, they've got some excellent consultants, and I'd strongly recommend you start there. Suppliers may be able to give you some information. I'm going to say the odds of that are slim. Um, generally, they don't know a lot of details on the stone that they're importing, but uh, there are no methods for steam room for stone at this time in the TCNA handbook. There is for slabs, uh, in, and again, NSI, or what, which is what used to be the MIA, uh, the NSI, they have a, a, a complete book on, on wet areas. And you can go online and pull that down. It's, I believe it's a free document. Um, I know I worked on that, and a few other steady material manufacturers worked on it with them as well. Yeah, I do think it's readily available, definitely. I think it is too. I think so, it's free. So yeah. It's a good source. So this, good goes, source. This, next, this next question goes right along with the same one, so I just want to bring it up here. Um, as a tile manufacturer, you know, how do you address the question of whether a product is recommended for a steam shower? Um, there's a lot of variables outside porosity, uh, outside of porosity. Um, it's tough to speak to in, in, uh, in those terms. So again, I think I'm not a tile manufacturer. I, I manufacture setting materials, so it's difficult for me to answer this. Um, I, I strongly suggest you reach out to your, your tile manufacturers. I am pretty sure the porcelains are all going to be recommended for this type of an application. I see no reason they wouldn't. Um, half of 1% absorption, I mean, it's an ideal type uh, finish material, uh, as opposed to very absorbative ones like wall tile or so on. And, and we know wall tile was used for years in steam rooms, but it was over mortar bed, you know, so it, it was a little different animal. Um, I'd suggest you talk to the tile manufacturer. Unfortunately, I don't have enough expertise in that to be able to answer that. So the gentleman that asked the question says that they are a tile manufacturer, and they're not, they don't feel comfortable answering the question. But um, I, I agree, if it's a porcelain, you know, if it's a th through body porcelain or a porcelain tile, that should glaze porcelain tile, that, that should be good. And I think you answered the question about stone, how to, uh, you know, where to go for stone. So I hope that answers their question. Um, here's another one. Is ANSI A118.15 mortar recommended or required for a steam room tile installation? Hmm. Um, I don't think it's required. I think it, I'd highly recommend it. And the difference between the 118.4 uh, latex uh, modified mortar, dry set mortar, and high performance, 118.15, one of the major differences in addition to much higher strength, flexibility, and so on, is a heat aging test. So they take the tile, bonded tile to tile, offset it an eighth of an inch for the shear test. Um, they'll take it to room temperature for 14 days, and then they take it to, I believe it's 150 some degrees for an additional 14 days. And then they have to break it or shear it, and it has to have a strength of, I believe, with porcelain, it's 200 PSI. And this is all off the top of my head. I, I could definitely be wrong on some of these numbers. But the point is, you're taking the extremes with this material. You're taking it from regular room temperature to very, very high temperature for an extended period of time, two weeks. It's sitting in this high temperature, and then it's sheared. So a heat aging test today, or a high-performance mortar to me, is an incredible tool in, in our toolbox. And you need to understand the, the, the benefits of that and where, you know, where they can be used. I, to me, I would never consider an exterior today without using that. Um, most submerged installations, certainly never a water line where it's getting wet and dried and, and so on. And the steam room's a perfect application for a 11815 mortar. Okay, all right, great. Um, Another question, can slip joint and movement joint be used interchangeably? Kind of. The big difference in the slip joint is only that it's a continuous membrane. So um, 
in the case of a steam room, you can imagine it's very, very important that it stay continuous from wall to ceiling, et cetera. In the case of a movement joint, it doesn't necessarily even require a membrane or waterproofing for that matter. So if we're trying to waterproof a pool, you know, and you want to do wall to floor and it's a mortar bed and you're building one out three quarters, the floor out an inch and a quarter, that's got a, again, that's a slip joint net wall to floor area. Um, so that waterproofing has to come down and be continuous through that opening and then pick up again on the mortar bed. I hope that helps explain it a little bit better. A movement joint does not require waterproofing. So it, how you treat that movement joint with waterproofing is a different animal, but I hope that answers it. As far as frequency, uh, if, if, if you're looking at the slip joint could be used for a movement joint in the amount of frequency because you are doing the perimeters, et cetera, et cetera, and it's a sealant over the top. Well, Jim, fantastic information, great presentation. Um, on behalf of all of our audience, I want to thank you. And um, audience, please look forward to our next webinar coming up, I believe, uh, later this month. We'll have invites sent out soon. And I thank you all for attending. Jim, thank you very much. And that ends our webinar. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Bye now.